Good evening, everybody. My name is Kate Hardy, and I'm a member of the core group of the SLN. And it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you to the final session of our Lenten journey. As you know, our theme is discipleship for artisans of our own destiny, preparing the future. The themes taken from the work of the Vatican COVID-19 Commission. When he was asked to sum up the aim of the commission, Pope Francis said, prepare the future. And this is radically different from prepare for the future, which implies that our future's already set and all we can do is react to it. Prepare the future focuses on our ability to become, in the words of Pope Paul VI, artisans of our own destiny. And so we gather together tonight, seeking to reflect on how we, as disciples of Jesus, can become artisans of our own destiny and prepare the future. Tonight, we begin in prayer. Yesterday, we celebrated the martyrdom of Oscar Romero, and we recall that Romero was martyred because he dared to name the idols. Throughout our Lenten journey, our companions have named the idols of today, the idols that were called to worship and on whose altars the poor and the marginalized and the earth itself are being sacrificed. Let us spend a few minutes reflecting on the idols of today. And now we pray our traditional prayer to the Holy Spirit by Dermot O'Murkew. Each verse will be read by a member of the core group and the words will be on the screen for you to join in. Come Holy Spirit, breathe down upon our troubled world. Shake the tired foundations of our crumbling institutions. Break the rules that keep you out of all our sacred spaces. And from the dust and rubble, gather up the ceilings of a new creation. Come, Holy Spirit, inflame once more the dying embers of our weariness. Shake us of our complacency. Whisper our names once more and scatter your gifts of grace with wild abandon. Break open the prisons of our inner being and let your raging justice be our sign of liberty. Come, Holy Spirit, and lead us to places we would rather not go. Expand the horizons of our limited imaginations. Awaken in our souls dangerous dreams for a new tomorrow. And rekindle in our hearts the fire of prophetic enthusiasm. Come, Holy Spirit whose justice outwits international conspiracy, whose light outshines spiritual bigotry, whose peace can overcome the destructive potential of warfare, whose promise invigorates our every effort to create a new heaven and a new earth, now and forever. Empowered by the Spirit, we continue the mission entrusted to us. Come, Holy Spirit, come. And now it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Father Jim Clark, 
who's a provincial of the Zavarian UK region. We're delighted that the UK Zavarian missionaries are one of the groups supporting our Lenten journey. Welcome, Father Jim, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Kim. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's, it gives me great pleasure to, to welcome amongst us Tom, who's going to speak to us tonight. Uh, I hadn't met Tom before. I, I met him virtually on Monday. And the fascinating piece of information he gave us at the start was that he had been vaccinated the same day that Boris Johnson had been vaccinated. So we're hoping that's the only similarity tonight. Uh, Tom was born in Dublin and uh, I was reading Tom's uh, biography uh, today and I think it's the most I've read since I studied theology many, many years ago. Uh, such a vast experience and such a, a, a huge amount of literature that Tom's written. Um, but tonight, um, <clears throat> Tom is coming to us tonight to talk of something very, very important, I think, which is uh, the Eucharist. Tom has taught in Dublin and in other parts of Ireland and has taught in Wales, uh, has many degrees behind him and is currently teaching in Nottingham. And uh, I was reading that his fascination, really, uh, as he teaches there, is um, how teachers, the early teachers of theology, uh, how they use tools to develop them and impact theology in the way it's taught. And he says that theology is a discipline that reflects its modes of communication far more than ac academic pursuits. And communication and, and the oral transmission of of Tom's theologies, his spiritualities, and his understanding of uh, theology is a very important part of his own understanding in terms of teaching. He also has a great fascination for liturgy, and um, tonight Tom is going to talk to us hopefully about the Eucharist. He said uh, in one of his publications on the Eucharist that the Eucharist is a great indicator of the theology of the people who celebrate it. It tells us lots about their beliefs and about um, <clears throat> what, their, what their hopes are. And tonight we're going to ask Tom to, to talk to us a little bit about celebrating Eucharist and to see Eucharist for us as an authentic sign and a manifestation of hope. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Tom who will uh, hopefully animate us. I know this is his third uh, lecture today, so, uh, all eyes are on you, Tom, and uh, thanks very much once again for coming. Can you hear us, Tom? Please bear with us. Rab, if you'd join me in keep an eye, keeping an eye on the waiting room because we seem to have lost Tom. Certainly will. Feel free to type any questions into the chat box. <laughs> Don't know, Rob, if you have another means of getting in touch with them just to make sure that everything's all right. I'll do that. Well, I've prepared for many possible technical issues, but I have to say this wasn't one of them. <laughs>
I wonder uh, if that's Tom coming in now. Hello, can you hear me now? We can indeed, Tom. We can indeed. I don't know what happened there. I, I certainly didn't press any buttons, but are we in business? We are. Okay, let's get to work. First of all, it's delightful to be speaking to you and let's keep our fingers crossed that Zoom will stay with us and keep us united in some way or other. I'm terribly encouraged at the moment when I'm speaking to people and they tell me that they're desperate to meet their family. They're desperate to meet up and hug their grandchildren. They're desperate to meet up and have a pint and they're desperate to meet and go out. This is, for Christians, really good news because it means that everything we've been saying about the human condition for 2,000 years and for another 1,000 years before that uh, within Judaism is actually still part of our real human DNA. We humans just love talking to one another. We are the social animals par excellence. And in fact, it's because we are such social animals that number one, we have been able to become as intelligent as we are. And the bad side of it is, it means that we like ganging up on one another and fighting. But religion says, Community is the good thing. Division is the bad thing. And it's not just any sort of community. It's a community that says we are really all bits of the whole. And now this, of course, uh, is when, when human beings are saying that again after the pandemic, Thatcher is spinning in her grave because there is such a thing as society. Society is not merely a social contract. All respect to uh, your Scottish brother, Adam Smith, but he didn't really believe in humanity. He believed in individuals and one individual made the top of the pin and the other put the point on it. And if the two of them worked together, they could make more money. Community was really conspiracy for Adam Smith. And that other genius Scotsman, Alexander Selkirk, created a notion that the ideal place was where you would be monarch of all you surveyed. And if anyone had the audacity to invade your island, you made them your servant, as in Man Friday, or you shot them. And suddenly we realized we don't want to do that. We want to actually go out and hug people. We want to actually break rules and celebrate togetherness. Now, why is that important to us as Christians? Because it suggests that human beings form not only any sort of community, but a community in which they flourish. I can only become really me when I can not only see you and talk to you, but when I can embrace you. Now, no, that, is, that sort of behavior is common to all of the great apes. It's common to gorillas, it's common to bonobos, it's common to chimpanzees. But we humans can only grow in our distinctive humanity when we realize we're part of a real community. Society exists before I do. And that's the old, the old classic explanation of that suddenly has new resonance. How do you know that? Because even when I share, when, even when I want to explore my most intimate and inmost thoughts, I have to use a language. And that language is a language that I receive from the society. So when I 
and I express myself as a linguistic animal, I express myself as a social animal. And now, for the first time in my 60 years, Have we lost Tom again? Yeah. Okay. It, it, it appears to just freeze. It must be his connection. I wonder um, if, Rab, if you're able to get in touch with him at the moment. And I wonder, Kate, if uh, I know we were planning to look at some of what's coming up at the end, but maybe if you wanted to run through that at the moment. And I'll let you unmute yourself. Thank you. Yes, because at the end of our meeting, um, we've been, we have our, our retreat planned for this Saturday with, it's going to be facilitated by Dermot or Murphy, and you probably have already signed up for it, but if you haven't, you're very welcome to still do that and join us, okay? Um, the other thing is that we still have um, up online change.org our petition for an inclusive new lectionary in church and we we ask that if you haven't signed it already that please please consider doing so and sharing it with your friends and that would be wonderful thank you very much uh, hello i'm back here and i don't know what to do I think what we might try, and I, I think Anne has made this suggestion in the chat as well, which is a very useful one. If everyone could pop the camera off, with the exception of Tom, um, that might be a help as well. So if we can all pop our camera off, that would be helpful. A notice came up on my screen saying it's in that it's an insecure connection. So I don't know what's... Anyway, what I was trying to suggest is that because we are a real human, we are a real human community and are feeling that again, we as Christians should say, well, we're the religion of community. You are not saved as an individual. The whole community is saved and you have chosen to belong to that community. Baptism is not my pass ticket into heaven. Baptism is my entry and acceptance of discipleship within the church. And in that community, where I seek to love one another as the Lord has loved me, there I grow to the fullness of humanity. That raises for us another question. How have human beings expressed their community most down the millennia? Our generation and our parents' generation, and for some of us, our grandparents' generation, is the very first group in human history that have not spent most of their time either gathering food or then preparing food. So we as human beings express who we are and grow to who we are, grow to whom we can be around the table. The table is our natural environment and sharing food, sharing meals is the sort of animals we are. It therefore should come as no surprise that within Judaism, the place to pray is during food and the place to express thanks to God and to mark the great acts of God through the year is not in a building. The synagogue is a teaching institution. The temple is unique, but the day to day life took place around the table. And it was there that God was thanked for all his goodness in creation and for providing food at the beginning of the meal. And then thanked again at the end of the meal for the joy of the food, the fun of the food, and the joy of the meal. 
So that's why we read that Jesus blessed, and then when supper was ended, he blessed again. So we are the community that gather and express ourselves in the most human of ways around a common table, establishing a new family of God as brothers and sisters. And we thank the Father in union with the Christ. And we carry out that thanksgiving in the Jesus way. So, when was the first Eucharist? The first Eucharist that is recorded is in the book of Chronicles, when David thanks God at a meal at the blessing of the first temple. We, who are members of the people of God by adoption, to use Paul's term, we thank the Father in the Jesus fashion. So our Eucharist is a Thanksgiving meal. But pardon me if you don't feel that that's anything like the experience of a Sunday morning. Just think of the experience of the average Catholic Sunday. You don't feel you're a guest at a meal. You don't feel you're a community. It's more like queuing up for a class, listening to words, and then for some people, eating something which would make a Marietta biscuit look nourishing. So one of the problems we have in the church is not the fall off that will, that's coming as a result of the pandemic, but the fact for generations we lose most of our young people because this is not a human experience that has any human meaning. So in building a future, we have to build community celebrations that are humanly meaningful. And once we build a meeting that's humanly meaningful, it can then be sacramental and point beyond the human to the divine. But at the moment, we have sacraments which we say are sign, they are physical realities pointing beyond themselves to spiritual realities. But in point of fact, they're not human realities, they're merely tokens. So if I were asked to say, how does the Eucharist of the future differ from what we've done? I put it in two words, get real. If we are really having a community meal, then we can start exploring how that community meal echoes the meals of Jesus, it echoes the meals of the Christians down the centuries, and somehow or other is an anticipation of the banquet of heaven. Christianity begins in a meal, it ends in a meal, and our Sunday experience should be a meal. I regularly go around speaking to groups of clergy and I find that there are various ways you can annoy them, not deliberately, but they just lose the rag. One of the funniest ways to do that is to say, does your parish have coffee after mass on Sunday morning? They all say, oh yeah, 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 yeah. The guild of such and such, uh, the lady society, they organize coffee. I say, wouldn't it be better to have it before Mass? Because you want to actually make people feel that they're coming into a community. You know, you come in, the first thing to do is make yourself comfortable, take your coat off, uh, and actually chat to people and get to know them. So why don't you, oh no, oh no, 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 no. They're there for Mass. 
that, that eating, that's just, that's just the trimmings on the cake. Do you see, do you see the inversion? Reality in terms of our everyday experience is just an add-on. It's the technical bit that's real. But that's not how people work. If, if faith doesn't make sense right in the, in the ordinariness of things, how can it be a pointer to the extraordinariness of things? So, very simply, I'm always frightened by this word real, because what, you, what, what do we mean by real? Well, I'll, I'll start with something. If we're going to thank the Father in the Jesus fashion, then we should be actually eating a real loaf just as Jesus took a real loaf and broke it and gave it to them and asked them to eat. So let's start with a real loaf. And that's something that someone in the community actually prepares. And they say, I'm providing them the loaf for the community. Then we have actually real drinking. That, can you imagine any party where there isn't, where, there is, where, where drinking isn't part of the joyfulness that, re, that actually tells us this is a good place to be. So we then move on to real drinking. And then we move on and say, this is a community that's really involved in service. We actually serve one another. And just as we're supposed to serve one another in every other part. We serve one another at this meal. If that were the case, we could then move on to start talking about a real community and a real liturgy that opens up to the divine. At the moment, we are all too lightly to think there's reality and there's liturgy. There's every day and there's mass. What we have to try and do is say, in the midst of our everyday life, we are a community. We express that community by coming together. And if we're going to come together, then we all have to feel that we each have a place at the table. There's a place at the table, it's there because God loves each sinner and his mercy is what constitutes us as a community. So we have to think of the table, not as the, not as the, not as the, the, the place of reward, but the place of welcome. The table, becomes the symbol of the reconciliation that the church preaches. The reconciliation that there's always space for one more. Then we can actually think of ourselves as truly at a banquet. And then this banquet will cast our minds back so that we are praising the Father in the Jesus way, and it casts our minds forward. There is a banquet beyond this life. A priest in New Zealand a few days ago was doing a survey to find out when he should change the times of masses because of a reorganization of parishes and he put he put a question on what sex are you and in what age group 
and he found the majority of his respondents were women over 65. And he came up with a very brief one-liner. He said, we're a church that's aging and disengaging. Now, the pandemic has taught us that we have to engage with one another. And if we are not to be aging and disengaging to the point of disappearance, then the future we must build must be one that's founded on real human communities. And here again, we need to think of our relationship with the great apes. Professor Robin Dunbar in Oxford has done a massive survey on what is the optimal size for a human community. And it's a function of the brain size of the primates, the communities that they can most adequately interact with. And the maximum size that humans can interact with is about 150 people. In point of fact, it's half that because no community is ever complete at any one time. So we have to think of ourselves as living in communities of about 75 people. And if you think about that, that's about the number of people. If 300 is, if 150 is about this, the number of people that you could know and recognize and regularly say hello to, you'll find that there's probably about 75 that are those you would send Christmas cards to and are in regular contact with. But you find there's an even smaller group that you spend even more time with. We as human beings can't operate beyond 150 and we operate best between 20 and 75. Too small and it's encroaching on our families. Too big and it just, it just becomes an organization and we feel a number in it. So that's another aspect of our Eucharist. We have to think of our communities as real human communities, which just can't be scaled up. At the moment, we've all got a background of big churches. Do you remember the giant barns built in the 50s? Right now we're closing some of the barns, but we're combining the groups. They're not natural groups. They, they're often geographically scattered and often they're too large. I'm conscious I'm speaking to a group in Scotland. Columba and Iona, 1400 years ago, considered the optimum, and he wasn't, a, he had never read Professor Dunbar and he'd never seen a great ape. He thought the largest monastery that could exist was 150 monks. And he said, if it's more than that, 12 should leave with an abbot. 13 of them should go off and found a monastery somewhere. So we know the maximum number of monks on Iona was 150. Paul, speaking to synagogues, probably never spoke to a community that was larger than 20 men. We know from the size of buildings in Corinth that early Eucharistic communities were about maximum, if you squeezed everyone in, 30 or 40 people. So we have to think in terms of real groups who have real dynamism between them and say, well, then where do we get our clergy? Well, do you really need the clergy laity divide? This new Eucharistic community is a place where we are all engaged. We are wholly celebrant. And then we find within our communities, those who can lead us in our service, those who can lead us 
in our remembering and those who can lead us in our gathering around the table. It's a little known fact of Catholic theology, and this is true of Catholic theology, wouldn't be true of Calvinist theology. There cannot be a vocation shortage. Within a Calvinist community, the preacher should, could be appointed directly by the Holy Spirit. It's a it's, it's direct charismatic appointment. For us, it's skill. That's why there are so many tiny little medieval church names all over Scotland. Because these were small communities and they had, it was one of their own who was then ordained to be their priest. So we have to think of this as a real community in a real meal with a real leader who belongs within the community. Then if it is humanly real, it can be sacramental of that which is greater than our reality. I'm sorry this has been disjointed because of the technology, but in a nutshell, that's my dream for building a future. Well, Tom, thank you very much. If I can take this opportunity to encourage everyone to start sharing questions, thoughts, reflections in the chat, and we'll get that discussion going. Just that reminder, you'll find that at the bottom of your screen. If you've got a slightly smaller screen or a phone or a tablet, you may need to press uh, more and then chat. But for our first question tonight, we're going to come back to Jim. Thanks, Tom, for that. Um, yeah, I, I was I was very interested in, in in what you were saying there about real community and the division or the the between laity and clergy. Um, I worked some time in the Amazon part of Brazil, where the model of church was based Christian community, and I'm just wondering what your thoughts are when. Uh, for many of them, they weren't allowed or couldn't have the Eucharist until I was there, uh, and yet they, they functioned as a real community. Um, so my question really is, you know, th that thing that you said there about do we really need, do we really need um, people from outside, particularly foreigners coming as priests, in order for that real community to, as you said, make the real meal happen and then be in touch with the real that is divine? Uh, I, I'll answer that in two parts. Uh, a few years ago, I gave, a, I gave a talk to some seminarians and there was a handful of them in a big hall. The seminary has since closed. And the theory was that was working among them was that they were bringing Jesus to the people. The model they kept using was, we're bringing Jesus. And no matter what I said to them, they couldn't see that that was, that was their model. They had Jesus, the people needed them, and they were a transferring system. And that's a wonderful, from the point of view of those young men, that's a wonderfully empowering notion uh, because, uh, you know, it's straight out of Clint Eastwood. He's the one who can, who can do what no one else can do. Uh, that was early on a Friday morning. That Friday evening, I was invited by one of my PhD students who was the, pastor of Vineyard Church in Nottingham, would I come and speak to a group of young people on a document that I've written on and that he was doing his PhD on called the Didda case. And I said, yeah, I'd be delighted to come along and take you, take you through the, the, this little document. And I was confronted with about 70 or 80 young people, men and women, 
not one of whom, as I was drinking coffee with them before, had struck me as being odd bods in the way the seminarians had struck me as being odd bods. Uh, and uh, I said, it's lovely. I said, you, you know, thinking is, I said, where are you all doing theology? Wondering, uh, you know, why aren't you doing it in my department? We could do it another, another 60 or 70 undergrads. And it turned out that these were all church leaders, 60 or 70 church leaders, each of whom had a task of building a house church of 12 members. So I was asking them, well, how successful are you? And they said, well, you know, we, we, we work together until we've enough and then we split into two. And, and what amazed me was that they weren't trying to replace the Holy Spirit. They were assuming that God was already present and the Holy Spirit was active. And what they were doing was bringing actualization and name because they were actually part of the communities that they were forming. I suspect one of our besetting sins in the clericalist church is that we don't trust the Holy Spirit. We think that ordination can do it instead. So if you go into a community of which you are just, you are just there to bring in expertise, well, that's very useful if you want someone to talk about the text of Mark's gospel in Greek or something. And that's, a, that's, that's, that's a, an expertise that is hand, that's held by just a couple of people and you bring the expert in. It's the same with, you know, you get some unusual disease. You go off to the far distant hospital and you get the one person who knows how to deal with that disease. But when we assemble to praise the Father, we claim, since I expect that we all accept creatio ex nihilo as an absolutely uncompromising basis of faith, there is nought that is not from God, uh, then praying to the Father is something that should inherently well up from us, particularly we who claim to have a knowledge of the Father. So why do we bring someone else in? Uh, it just strikes me as a theological nonsense. And I also think it's a missionary nonsense because it makes it, it, it assumes that God is like, it's, 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 it's never, we never, we never think of Catholic missionaries as engaging in a cargo cult. But um, one of the differences between the missionaries that arrived uh, in the early Middle Ages in these islands uh, and missionaries arriving, say, in Africa in the 1950s was the missionaries who arrived in these islands 1800 years ago came to the same technology and the same level of society as the people they were preaching to. Whereas the missionaries that went out to Africa, even if they weren't following the flag, they always knew the flag was there and they drove up in a Land Rover exactly the same as the district commissioner. So I think, I think it's theologically nonsense and I think it's missiologically nonsense. And that applies as much to mission in Scotland as it does in the Amazon. Thanks, Tom. Uh, if I can turn to the, the chat now, and what I'll do is I'll just, I'll put to you a selection of the questions from the chat. And if I could start with, with Rab's, a simple question, but probably not a simple answer. How does your dream become a reality? Uh, well, the very fact that there are, how many people are listening to this? We have 65 on the call at the moment. Okay, well, let's assume that two or three of them have gone out of the room to the loo or 
two or three have gone out to make tea. It's, it's worth noting as well, Tom, just it's worth saying that as I'm looking around, you know, a few people have got cameras on and the, there's a few where it's, you know, two or three people sitting in the household as well. There are 60 people talking about some of the most fundamental issues in liturgy and some of the most fundamental issues in theology and in mission. I've, I've been writing this stuff since the early 1990s. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, when I first wrote this uh, and gave it as a seminar in, in, in I first gave, I first gave a, a, a lecture on Dunbar's number and its implications for the priesthood in 1985 or something. No, 80, wait now, more than, in, in late nine, eight, 1989, uh, and in fact, Dunbar hadn't done the work. It was far more dodgy work from the United States that we used in those days. And everyone in the room, most of whom were clergy, just laughed at it and wondered, you know, what I was saying. So the very fact that we're even taking all this seriously uh, is, that is part of the dream until we actually imagine it and realize it can be different, nothing changes. By the way, Anne Dixon, I've just turned on the chat, says, I'm a 64 year old woman and I'm challenged by the assumption that a church of 65 year old women is disengaged and dying. The problem is, it, it, yes, it was, it was the 65 year old women that were engaged and alive, but we also need far more men and we also need the 15 year olds and the 18 year olds and all the others. So, and by the way, I'm also in that in that age group. So, you know, and we're, we're both in the same boat, but we need the church to be there when both of us are no longer here. And that'll be a lot sooner for us than it will be for Callum with God's help. Thanks, Tom. And, and you know, again, just maybe indulge me in a bit more kind of practicality if we turn to Carol's question, who's asking on a more practical level, how do we move to this model of celebrating the Eucharist? How do we go from where we are now to that model? I think the first thing we have to do is we have to try and engage the priests we have now to have the courage to experiment with new forms of community. Uh, most of our most of our weekday communities are far smaller than 65. Uh, people say, oh, but that would never work in our parish. We've we're, we're, uh, most of our actual communities are, are quite small. And we should be turning those into the type of communities we're trying to imagine. And then we should be as communities telling the bishops, this is the way things are and making it clear, this is not only the way things are, but we see this as an expression of our witness. So think of the group with which you celebrate the Eucharist, not at Easter, but on an average Sunday or an average weekday. And you would find that that community move out of the, 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 the pews in a church are there so that you can listen to a homily. They're there. It's a lecture hall. It's, it's totally the wrong space. But most of us have a church hall. There are many churches that have sacristies that are big enough for 65 people. So if you really want to get nitty gritty, what you say is right, let's find a hole, put chairs around the edge, get an ordinary dinner table. We all have, we all, every church building has, a, has, a, has an ordinary size, put it right in the center and then say, now we can gather around. 
you go down to Lidl, where you can get a sourdough loaf. Sourdough, because that brings out all the imagery that Paul uses. And you begin there. Uh, if you have a standard size, if you have a standard size chalice like that one, you can go for the expensive option, which is made on Iona. Or you can go for the even more useful or convenient option, which you buy in Costa. It beats this one hands down because while that looks pious and lovely and all the rest of it, that's not, that's not a community cup. That's just a posh version on a private one person's glass. So you get rid of the, you get rid of send, that sends out the signal. The drink is really for me because I'm the special person celebrating for you. This holds exactly the same amount as the Arda chalice or the Derry Navlan chalice in both of which would have been used identical to the ones used in the Scottish church in the Middle Ages. That holds the same amount. And like the Arda chalice, it has two lug holes. So it's very easy to pass from one person to a next. You don't have a service receiver system. Each person serves the next which is what happens in any proper community meal. In a meal of equals, everyone serves everyone else. In a hierarchical meal, the servants serve the big people. In a service culture, the petrol attendant dishes out the petrol. So having people serving, that it's putting people into two periods. So you see, you pass from one to another which is exactly what happened. That's why all our ancient chalices have handles. So these are simple things. They can be implemented the moment Nicola Sturgeon lets you assemble again in a church building. That tone maybe brings- You asked me to be practical. So now I've gone really <laughs> down to the nitty gritty. It maybe brings us on to our next question. I want to, to turn to Margaret Ann's question and I, I maybe see it in two parts. Our, our question is, so the leader could be a woman or a man, but maybe if we could ask, is there a leader? Uh, at the moment in the Catholic Church, that's a step way too far because we have not yet thought out officially the theology of that. That doesn't mean I'm not in favor of it, but it means that if you do that now, all you do is you create a split in the church between the radical one group and then the other group say, we're the true. Likewise, Inequality has no place at the Eucharist, but the last thing we need is women clergy. What we actually need is a community of service. If this were a normal Holy Thursday that's coming up next week, we would have the washing of the feet. And in the 1956 rite, which is what we're using today, it's usually the parish priest, or the, it was originally the parish priest, now it's the priest who washes a token number of feet. And it's interpreted in terms of, oh, isn't the parish priest showing his humility? He's there to serve us. But read John's gospel. It's not parish priest miming Jesus. It's not parish priest showing that, even though he's the, the boss, he's actually thinks of himself as the servant. It's we're all servants. He said, if I've washed your feet, you must wash each other's feet. 
So imagine if on Holy Thursday, instead of the parish priest washing 12 people's feet or a token group or even everyone's feet, everyone had to wash everyone else's feet. Now, everyone is a servant of everyone else. By this you shall know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. Now everyone is serving. What we actually need is not women priests or young priests or married priests. We need a community where everyone has a vision of service to one another. Now that was, that just didn't enter our heads a few years ago, because if you, if you speak to, to most clergy, they actually use a variant on Adam Smith's pin making activity to explain this as well. They do this, we do that. So we need a community of service. Now we do, we do need someone, not who will lead in the sense of being the Sergeant Major, but a community celebration always has to be coordinated. So we have to think of ourselves as presiding to facilitate the whole community to act in the Christ in praising the Father. So does that somehow? That's useful. And I think that image of, of service is particularly powerful. If you'll indulge me, I, I find it slightly entertaining um, after your presentation tonight when, when you're talking about something being a radical step too far. Uh, yeah, we, you, the, 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 the question we have is that the unity of the church is a gift of the spirit and it's something that we have to value and treasure, not least because it allows us to give credible witness that we are the people of God. So uh, whenever any group says, we've got all the answers, uh, they're, that's just getting into human, uh, our desire to have the split. You know, in, when, uh, Whenever a political party is founded in Ireland, once some wag gets on and says, should we have the split now and get it over with? Uh, the church exists to present the reconciliation of God. And part of that reconciliation is that we are forming a true human family which breaks over the boundaries of the rich and the poor, the slaves and the free and all the rest. Now we've been, we're always hopeless at that, but in the name of some imagined perfection, we mustn't end up splitting the church again. So we have to try and, when every church, every community, is genuinely eating, genuinely drinking, genuinely serving one another, then we can worry about the next stage. But we have an awful lot of foot work to do. I asked a group earlier today, uh, you know, the, uh, is the, you know, is the Eucharist about getting to Jesus? Or is it being with Jesus going to the Father? And all the hands went to, it's getting to Jesus. It's interesting, to, we're, we're getting quite a lot of uh, pick yeah. up in the chats, you know, the, picking up on the fact that your vision of a Holy Thursday Mass washing one another's feet is very much the practice in, in some parishes. I want to move on to our next question though, because we're getting, your, your talk has generated a lot of conversation tonight. Um, so I want to get through as many of these questions as we can and come to Mary's question who, who notes that you've spoken about real communities and real Eucharists and asks, would you speak about the real presence and how that fits within your dream?
The problem with the concept of presence is a very interesting one. Uh, once a month, I get a letter through the post with, from the bank and it tells me how much money is present in my account. And that's factual presence. It's terribly important and it's terribly real. Equally, someone can say, where is the hammer? And you say, it's over there. Now that's factual presence. Now think of this group on the, in this, this Zoom call tonight. Some people are very present. But I'm sure there's some people whose minds have just wandered off or who are distracted. Now, are they're present, but also they're not present. Now let's think about the presence of the Christ. The beginning of John's gospel, we say that through him, everything was made and without him was not anything made that was made. So the word is present everywhere in the creation. And the word became flesh and built, he set up his tent among us. So the idea that the Christ is absent is just theologically a nonsense in terms of our vision of the creation. And then we think of the risen Christ, who is no longer limited to being in one place, but is present throughout the church. So the real, the, the, the focus on the real presence has to cope with this. Could you imagine a place where the Christ is absent? For a Christian, no such place exists. Now, unfortunately, one very quick way of presenting the Eucharist in the period around 600 was to say, why should you go along and take part in this lengthy ceremony is much longer in a language you don't understand behind a screen which you can't see through. And the answer was, ah, no one doubted the reality of, of relics. So here was the greatest relic, a living relic of the Lord himself. And suddenly we've started to focus on the presence of Christ using the same sort of model of presence that we use for how much money is in our bank account, where is the hammer, are you sitting in the sitting room or in the kitchen. So it's a very complicated matter uh, and it's, it has riddled the Western church so much so that it's what we fight over most. Uh, you went into an Orthodox church. They do keep they do keep some of the loaf in the church for those who get sick. But if you say, "Where's the Blessed Sacrament to genuflect to?" They'll explode because they say you can't refer to a sacrament in that way. So it's, it, really is a, it really is a distraction from what the Eucharist is about. No, 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 the Eucharist is about Jesus. Well, look at the prayers we say. We don't say we come to you, Jesus. We come to you, Father. All our prayers are addressed to the Father. And then we conclude them through him, with him, in him. Through the Christ, with the Christ, in the Christ. So I know this hurts Catholics, but we have a theory that we've nothing, you know, we've nothing to learn, certainly nothing from the Protestants and 
probably very little from the east. We really have to come to grips with some of the some of the very awkward stuff that just doesn't add up in our theology of the Eucharist. If I can turn then to, um, perhaps I can turn to uh, Marion's question. And I suspect I can guess the answer to this one, but perhaps it would be useful to you, for, for you to, to explain to us where we're at. Is there any indication of what Pope Francis might think of this vision? Um, well, the simple answer is, <laughs> I, I'm not on the pay grade that, 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 that he, he rings me to have a chat with me. So if we can turn well, Francis the... has said that everything that happens in the church today has to be founded on the vision of the Second Vatican Council. The Second Vatican Council was not a single moment in time. It was the beginning of a process. And the key part of that process is we're not a two-tier church, a teaching church and a listening church. We don't have a technical group of sacerdotes who do the liturgy on behalf of the other people. We are the pilgrim people who form a priestly people and all of us must be engaged together. Now that is the central vision of the Second Vatican Council when it comes to how we gather and how we pray. The renewed liturgy was to refocus that liturgy is our worship in Christ, who is the only priest, to the Father. We were then told to change our furniture. Clergy thought that meant that you could see more clearly. It was to be a table we could gather around. If you go into an older Catholic church, it's the reservation space that is the focus of all the lines of the church. That was to be taken to one side, preferably was to be put in a separate chapel. Vestments, which are there to separate people, were to be simplified. Communion under both kinds was to be reintroduced. We were to use more meaningful symbols. We were to make sure that it was humanly comprehensible. So we abandoned a language that hardly anyone could speak. So if the Pope says we are to base our teaching on the Second Vatican Council, and is now proposing a synodal vision for the church, then we have to keep moving along that, 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 that line. But that's just a guess. If I can turn then to Rosa's question, Tom, how do we end the clergy lay divide in a church that is so wedded to clericalism? Uh, the simple answer to that is that we've had we've had ways of behaving inbuilt into us for centuries. Um, it was even before Constantine had made the church legal that clergy had decided they were entitled to special privileges and they would be entitled to wear special uniform and they should be given special greetings in the marketplace and allowed to use the word reverend in front of their names. That's 306. It's interesting, we don't have a sacrament of ministry in the church. We have a sacrament of order. And the ordo within the Roman Empire was the gentry. So to become a member of the clergy 
was to join the holy gentry. And it's deep. Medics refer to people like me as laymen. So anyone who knows nothing is a lay person. So it's going to be very difficult to root it out. It's built up over centuries. And, and also it's very hurtful. We still rely on those who are pre bishops, priests and deacons in the church, but many of them don't realize how hurtful it is to leave aside the clerical, the, all the little perks of, of, it's much easier for instance, to just say, these are the hymns we're going to use and send a note up to the organ gallery and tell the organist play these hymns and to try and find out, well, what hymns do we as a community want to sing this day? Uh, speaking to a young priest last year, just before lockdown, he turned to me and said, why are you ashamed of being a priest? Well, I'm actually proud that I am baptized and within the community of the faithful, I'm a presbyter but he could not see distinguishing himself by a special uniform. He said, I'm a witness. No, 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 no. It's the church that is the witness. It's all of us who are witnesses. And all he is, is in, in terms of his uniform, is a witness to a certain structure. But that, these are big, these are big intellectual. Uh, I was looking at some Presbyterian clergy in Ireland, at the same meeting just before lockdown last year. And um, John Calvin said, no, 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 no. The minister is, is one of us. He's just a teacher. They were all wearing Roman collars. I'm very but, conscious of, of time, Tom, so if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll try and get through a couple of questions before we, we draw to a close. Claire asks, to achieve this vision, do we really need to just start again from scratch? We never start again from scratch. We all, every, everything, everything, every tomorrow is, is, is the following on from today. We don't start from scratch. We don't lose heart. We we move one step at a time. Uh, uh, the Holy Spirit is not some sort of guarantee that uh, that things will go right. If that were the case, the Church of North Africa that produced uh, Augustine of Hippo would still be a flourishing center of Christianity. Uh, and the same would be true of the Church of Syria. But what the Holy Spirit is, is the energy to say that tomorrow it is worth getting up because God loves us. And then we say, how do I make the first step? And how, Tom, how then uh, do we go about this? Should we, as Anne says, just be setting up our own Eucharistic communities if the clerics won't? Uh, I am amazed, and I, now I may be completely naive in this, I am amazed at the number of brother Christians who are presbyters who are just waiting to feel that they won't be attacked if they have a more humanly meaningful liturgy, because often they are just as aware of how it's become an alienated liturgy. It's a liturgy that we're, where we're going through the motions and they're frightened 
They're frightened of bishops who will read the riot act to them, but they're also frightened that it'll scare people. <coughs> you say, if you, if I've, I've given variants on this lecture, say, never work in my parish. You have, you have no idea what the people are like. They just don't want change. You know, they're, they're big into the Latin mass society. The Latin mass society are, are effectively in schism. They tend to go off and meet up with their own mates and uh, worship Latin through the medium of God. Uh, fine. So we have to actually let, uh, let people, this is, this is a far more real way to be community. This is a way that reflects what we've discovered again in lockdown. Uh, when Margaret Thatcher came out with that thing, there's no such thing as society. Not one Catholic bishop said, that is unacceptable to us as Catholics. Not one came out and said it. Later on, they issued a wishy-washy document called the common good. I remember going through it with a group of students in Milltown when it came out and having to explain the, the, the scholastic categories to them. Now suddenly people have all discovered this again. So the local parish priest, he may have discovered it and he may be just waiting to hear, look, let's talk about how we can have a real community celebration and, 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 and start doing it doing it in a new and real way. Uh, I've actually spoken to a group, I won't mention the diocese uh, in case I did, where I spoke to the clergy on during the weekday and then the one parish priest invited me back to his parish where I spoke to the community on the Saturday morning. The clergy all said the laity wouldn't wear it. And then the laity on Saturday morning said the clergy wouldn't wear it. I'm very conscious of time, but perhaps we could squeeze one more question in, Tom. And if I can turn to Patricia's question, she speaks about working in a, a parish, um, half the, the city of Norwich, Norwich, sorry, where um, ecumenical relations involved about five independent Protestant groups. And, and she spoke about the kind of tendency to narrowness and inward looking uh, and to collapse if the one or two charismatic individuals vanished. How would really small communities, which you know, she heartily agrees with, avoid these difficulties? That is, how do we combine a small, local and a wider vision? Uh, communities, communities are always forming and reforming. And we have had an illusion that because the parish as an institution can exist, sometimes for centuries, that the community exists equally for centuries. Uh, how many of us know all our relatives beyond our first cousins? So for instance, the, even, our, um, even, our, even our biological families, the, the the one group that we feel, usually feel very close and feel there's real bonds with, those groups are constantly mutating. Someone goes off and they, they live in another part of the world or we lose contact. So communities are forming and reforming and it's maintaining that, that sense that we, we're, we're not going to become the biological expression of a parish. A parish is a legal institution. A community is something that's forming and reforming. And within it, we grow and we act and we become for that place at that time, the witnessing people of God. Well, Tom, thank you very much. I've enjoyed our conversation tonight. And I will hand back to Jim.
Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Tom, for that. Um, the word that kept jumping out for me was uh, real. That was the key word for me. You spoke of real bread, real drink, real service of the other at the table, real community, real liturgy, and this becomes a real connection to the divine. And I feel tonight your talk has been very real. Certainly, if you excuse the pun, real food for thought. Over the weeks in this group, we've spoken about idols. And perhaps the Mass, rather than Eucharist, has become an idol for us. I was thinking of the decision yesterday, the Court of Session decision, to allow worship to recommence. Perhaps because we were appealing, because we missed the Mass more than we missed the community. Tom, I think tonight you've helped us dream of other possibilities of making the Eucharist more real, of making community more real, and therefore making the divine more real. And I'd like to thank you for your contribution this evening. I just want to say it's lovely to be with you all. Uh, a year ago, we went into lockdown. Uh, did any of us think that 60 of us would be meeting on a Thursday evening to discuss the basis of liturgical theology? That surely is a blessing in the midst of a lot of pain and suffering. And thank you all for your patience and for your questions. I was trying to read them with one eye, but there's no way I could talk back to, listen to Callum's questions I find it terribly distracting that I have my, I, I see my own face and I think, oh God. But, uh, and I was trying to, so look, uh, every blessing on Holy Week and Happy Easter. And thank you for inviting me. Thank, thank you, Tom. Thank you. And before we go into our final prayer, I'd just like to add my thanks uh, to Callum and to Rab for all the technology this evening. We're surely tested a little bit tonight and to Jim for joining us uh, and especially to you, Tom, for just speaking in such a fresh breath of air. It was wonderful to hear you and to really make it, as, as Jim said, it was so real, a real personal encounter with Jesus to know that you know, he hears what, I, what I'm thinking, what I'm hoping, my hopes and fears, as we've all traveled along this journey of Lent this year and in a time of COVID. So we, you know, I, I pour all of that into my cup of tea when I sit at my table. So thank you for making it so real this evening. Um, and now we're going to finish with a, a closing prayer tonight. Um, we have, on this Feast of the Annunciation, a special prayer um, by a poem by Don Pedro Casal da Liga. Uh, Don Pedro said that through prayer, Mary sustains him. For the Mary he knows says yes to the promptings of the spirit. And in this obedience, takes up a completely unknown, terrifying and ultimately joyful road. This Mary, is full of life and hope, and uh, will our companion be as we prepare the future. By saying your name, Mary, we say that poverty has drawn the attention of God's eyes. By saying your name, Mary, we say that the promise knows what a mother's milk tastes like. By saying your name, Mary, we say that our flesh clothes the silence of the word. By saying your name, Mary, we say that the kingdom comes walking alongside history. By saying your name, Mary, we say that we are with the cross and with the flames of the spirit. By saying your name, Mary, we say that every name can be full of grace. By saying your name, 
Mary, we say that every death can also be his passion. By saying your name, Mary, we say that his all is the cause of our joy. And now for you, Tom. Loving God, we thank you for the gift and insight of Tom. We thank you for what he has shared with us tonight. We ask that you anoint him in you with your spirit, such that your life may be deepened within him. Loving God, we thank you for the gift of the Zavarian missionaries. May they be messengers of God's love, witnesses of hope, and builders of God's kingdom, and be an example to the wider church and to the world community that it is possible to be one as Jesus wills. We pray for all of us gathered here tonight. Come Holy Spirit, infuse in us the dream and vision of Jesus, such that we may become disciples who are artisans of our own destiny, preparing the future. Amen. And as I said just a little bit earlier when Tom got cut off our Zoom, I just draw your attention quickly to our Lenten retreat this Saturday with Dermot and Murphy. Um, if you haven't already signed up, you're very welcome to join us. And also the last little bit of business is that we still have our petition, which we ask people to please sign uh, asking for an inclusive uh, use of language in our lectionary and church. Thank you so much for joining us and being our companions on our Lenten journey. It's been a privilege and a pleasure to be with you. God bless you. <laughs>